<laughs> so first of all, I'd like to introduce my sister, Nancy Rosie, and her husband, Bob. They own and live in the in Lily Crawford's old house in Denver. So many of the things I'm going to show you uh, during this presentation come from her house. Um, and she's still pulling treasures out from hidden drawers and, cool. and boxes. So. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the, the, what prompted this talk is last October, my brother sent me a, uh, a box of diaries. And included in those diaries were, were these five books right here. And they turned out to be the diaries of Lily uh, Marjorie Crawford from 1880, no, I'm sorry, 1881, 82, 83, 85, and 86. So, you know, first of all, there's one missing. <laughs> and I know that there's, it's missing because Lily Crawford Pritchett, the author, and the daughter of Lily Crawford, wrote this book, Diary of Lily Marjorie Crawford. Um, she wrote this book back in the 70s. And then her subtitle is A Little Girl's View of Life in the Old West, 1880-1881. And when you open it up, the very first page has a picture of the 1880 diary. Yeah. So that 1880 diary is missing. Somewhere in Nancy's house probably, <laughs> in some drawer. So, uh, but now we have the other five diaries. So the, this begs the question, why bother you know, talking about these diaries since Lolita, who's a much better author than I'll ever be, talked about them and wrote this nice, beautiful book uh, about the diaries. And there's two answers to that. First of all, she didn't mention at all the 1882, 83, 85, and 86 diaries. So there's a lot more material here. And second of all, when I started transcribing these diaries, I realized she only, she cherry picked what was the best parts of the diary. So, you know, she has lots of, of excerpts of the diary here, but there's only about 20% of the words in the diary are in this book. And the other 80%, you know, you, you can't read. So, and those 80, other 80% share their lot of repetition. Uh, it's certainly not, a lot of it's not historical. But by studying it, you can, can learn a lot of things. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I'll have these five diaries up here later. There's two sets of diaries uh, are one page per day. And two of the diaries are two, uh, one page for two days. So they're you know, half as, as thick. And then finally, the, the final one, the 1883 diaries, is just a, a notebook. You know, it's a line notebook that she just started writing. She'd write the date on it and, and do whatever. But my favorite one is the 1885 diary. And first of all, it's, it's you know, bound in leather, has a wonderful feel to it. It's, it has a gold trim on the pages. All the pages are in pristine condition. It's, it's truly amazing. We know she wrote in this every day. So she was opening and closing the book, you know, at least close to 400 times. The leader wrote, read the book so she, you know, opened and closed it. Uh, but there's no, no bending of the pages, no tears, no rips, no crinkling. It's all just in wonderful, excellent con condition. So what I did was I took all five diaries and photographed them, photographed each page. So once I photographed them, I could put them away and, and I didn't have to worry about harming them anymore. Uh, and so I transcribed them. I actually had to read through them twice to get a transcription. And I have, I now have a complete transcription, which I've put up on my, my website. And I'll, I have what's, my one slide uh, for this talk is, 
is on a piece of paper which was on everybody's roll, if you could pass it back and forth. But at the bottom of that is the uh, URL for my website. So if you go there, you'll see that there's a, a, doc, a page for each of these uh, diaries. Okay, so before I, I talk much about the contents of the diaries, I'd like to put this into context. Um, first of all, I hope you all know, you know who the Crawfords were and, and who Lily Crawford was. Uh, you know, the Crawfords were the founding uh, family of, of Steamboat. Lily was the oldest daughter. She was, was born in Sedalia in 1867. Uh, her, her next brother was born in 1869, Logan. And her, uh, the second brother was John born in 1873, and John is Nancy and my uh, grandfather. So the Crawfords left Missouri in 1873 and got on you know, a covered wagon and headed out to Colorado. And in the middle of this, this sheet, there's sort of a timeline of important dates for a uh, steamboat. So 1870, Oh, I missed one. 1874 in June is when uh, James Crawford, her, her father, first set foot in, in Steamboat Springs. And two years later, in eight, June of 1876, the Crawford family came to, um, to live here permanently. They were the, the first permanent residents in the area. Then the, the next big date is 1879 in September when the Meeker incident occurred. And that had the, the effect of clearing the whole county out. <laughs> you know, virtually everybody in the county left uh, and you know, went to Denver or east of the, the mountain range for that winter. There was a few miners that stayed at Hans Peak. And I think there were three cowboys that uh, kept watch over a, a herd of cattle near Hayden. Otherwise, everybody in the, the county, including the Crawfords, moved away. So the Crawfords moved to uh, Boulder. Uh, but then in the springtime, or the next summer, they moved, came back to Steamboat. <coughs> okay, the next big date, it, date is down here, July 1883, is when Horace Settle moved to Steamboat, and he brought his sawmill with him. So before that time, every building in the area was a log cabin. And then after that time, they now had lumber that they could you know, build normal frame houses with. So that was July of 1883. In January of 1884, the Steamboat Springs Company Incorporated, they were the ones that owned 600 acres in the valley here. They plowed the land, laid out the streets, maintain the streets, sold the lots off to prospective settlers. And they basically maintained the town until the town incorporated in 1900. Okay, the next year, uh, well, <laughs> this really isn't Steamboat. The uh, next Steamboat one is July of 1885, is when James Hoyle moved to town. He brought a printing press, and in July, he he printed the first copy of the Steamboat Pilot, uh, which certainly was a watershed event for the, the area. Okay, and finally, three years later, in 1888, the railroad came to Walcott. So that meant that now, instead of taking the long uh, journey from Denver to Empire to, through middle, uh, Middle County to here, Middle Park. You could take the railroad to Walcott and then take a one and a half day stagecoach ride up here. Okay, so that was the middle column. If you look over here, there's three columns that show where Lily lived during this period, just to give you, you know, a reference of, of where the diaries are talking about. It starts in Boulder the first six months. Then they moved back to Steamboat for a year and a half. Uh, then moved back to Boulder because Margaret was pregnant. 
and had her had the fourth child uh, marry. Uh, so Margaret and Lily and the baby stayed in in Boulder for a year and a half. Pa and the the two boys came back to Steamboat for the summertime. Okay, then you know it was six months in Steamboat, then six months in Sedalia. Six months in Steamboat, six months back in Sedalia. And those two times in Sedalia is when Lily uh, went to school. Not school, but she took uh, lessons. And we'll, we'll talk about that later. Then she came back to Steamboat for a year and a half. And then finally, right at the end of, of her diaries, they moved, well, they went back to uh, Sedalia. And that's, I think they moved, went back there because uh, Pa had just been reelected to the state legislature. So he had to be in Denver for the, you know, all the, the state house meetings in January, February, March. So since he was out there in Denver, the whole family went with him and uh, went to the Sedalia for the end of the year. Okay, so, you know, the interesting part about these diaries is it covers Lily's uh, teenage years. The first diary, 1880, she turned 13 when three months into the diary. And the last diary, 1886, yeah, December 31st, she was still 19 years old. So this covers her, her teenage years. And it also sort of covers the teenage years of Steamboat. You know, as the diaries are covered the time when Lily goes from being a kid to being an adult, it follows the time when Steamboat was basically not even a, a town or a community, it was just a bunch of the Crawford cabins, to when Steamboat became a village and finally a town. So it's, it's interesting to, to be able to to see her transformation and to see the transformation of the, the city, of the town. And you can see that I put two lines in here uh, which talk about the population of Steamboat. The first one in 18, 1881, Steamboat had 27 people in the greater Steamboat area. And that's sort of the area between, you know, Steamboat down to Pleasant Valley, Sydney, uh, Yellow Jacket Pass, and then all the way up uh, around the bend to where the Elk River flows into the Yampa, and then up the Elk River to Mad Creek. So that whole area is sort of the area where people could come within, could in one day come to, to the Crawford Cabins, visit, do some things, and still return to their home. Uh, and in fact, in 1885, the Colorado census of 1885 uh, sort of called that area the village of Steamboat Springs. So in that area, there were 27 people and six children. And all six of those children were the Crawford kids. There were two Crawford families, the James and Margaret family. And James had a brother, Henry Crawford, who also came here. And he was married and had two kids. Uh, so, the only kids were in the two Crawford families. You know, Lily must have been extremely lonely not to have any other play playmates other than her two brothers. And in fact, in the whole, in that area, other than her mother and her aunt, the only other female was Mrs. Farnsworth, who lived over on Elk Creek, or Elk River, sorry. So it's, was basically a, a bunch of single men in the, the community. And as I say, the, the Crawford cabins here in Steamboat. There were six total, six log cabins in what's now Old Town. Okay, you fast forward to 1886, five years later, and you see the, the population has almost tripled. There's now 71 people. And of those, 28 were kids. So at that point, there were seven or eight families uh, and, you know, 28 children, so <laughs> lots of, of people to, to play with. There were no, no girls Lily's age, but 
there were three girls that were three and four years younger than Lily. So finally she had people to, to do things with, other girls to talk to and, and you know, to experience things with. So the, the buildings, there were now 12 buildings within, within the old town. So uh, that had doubled. And then finally, if you go forward another three years to 1888, that's when the railroad came and Steamboat had its boom. Oh, yeah. In that one year, there were 31 building, new buildings built and the population at the end of the year was over a couple hundred people. So this period comes from, you know, expands the time when it was the Crawford cabins to where there was a village of, you know, seven or eight families to where there was now finally a town of several hundred people. Okay, one final thing I just want to point out. Uh, you know, the, the diaries, I, they don't tell a story. It, it's a bunch of what I like to call threads. Each day she'll, have, she'll write, you know, six or eight sentences or phrases which are completely unrelated to each other. She might mention, you know, the chore that she has to do. The, uh, they got mail. They uh, maybe they went. Somebody went fishing in the family. And, you know, all these different one-sentence uh, facts that happen. And by itself, it, you know, it doesn't tell you anything. But if you follow any of those threads over the, over time, you know, you can see uh, fishing. If you just look at what days they fished on you find out that, gee, her mother was the big fisherman in the family. And not by a little, but by a lot. She probably fished more than all the rest of the family put together. And when they did go fishing, she would catch 20, 30 fish at a time. Wow. So, you know, if you just look at any one, one day, you don't see very much. But if you follow the threads through, you, you can learn a lot. So one of the threads I followed was the travel time between Empire and Steamboat. Uh, she, she traveled between those two cities eight times in this period, time period. Uh, but only five of, of those times she was writing a diary. So if you look at those five times, I've, I've got the travel times over here. And you see that you know, at, at the start of the, the time period, it took seven to 11 days to, to make that uh, distance. Uh, whereas in the final years, 85 and 86, it was down to three to five days. Mm -hmm. So obviously the roads were a lot better and, and Steamboat was, you know, in a real sense closer to Denver because people could, didn't take as long to travel that far. The other thing you notice from the, these travel times is there were th basically three travel seasons. You know, from December to the May, nobody could, nobody traveled. Maybe the mail carriers would. You know, you could go by, by skis uh, over the passes, but you could, you couldn't take a wagon over. So nobody was traveling during those times. So you either came in June, you know, as, as soon as, just after the snow breakup, or you went in the summertime, or you went in November right before the snows came. And if you look at the travel times, you realize July and August and September were the quickest times by easily a factor of two. Uh, whereas June, the problem with June was the, all the water was high. And when you read the diary, yes, you, you, you realize that every time they came to a big stream like Fish Creek, for example, they'd have to camp and it, it would would take a day just to cross a little stream like that. Uh, so that slowed things down in June. In November, it was the snows on top of the peaks that slowed them down. And again, if you look at the November times versus the, the July times, you know, it's, uh, you didn't want to travel in November. And also in November, if you read the diary, you realize she was really miserable during those two trips. Uh, she said it was really cold every single day. 
uh, she couldn't wait until they got to the the place where they could camp and she could warm up. Okay, so now the back to the diaries. While I was reading the diaries, one of the the neat things I discovered was they mentioned some some other things which items that we have. And every time she mentioned an item that I had, it sort of made it a little bit more real. Uh, so I'm going to spend some time sort of a show and tell, talking about these other items and, and how, and read some of the, her diary entries about these items. Uh, th these items include things like her, her paintings, her, uh, the organ, the uh, Christmas menu, her teaching, photographs, uh, autographs. So the first one I want to talk about is her paintings uh, because she's sort of known in this museum as an artist. I mean, you know, not only are a lot of her paintings distributed or displayed here in the museum, but the museum has all of programs throughout the year which use her name, you know, art programs for kids. So before reading the diaries, I knew of, of, of about 50 paintings that she had. And unfortunately, she only signed maybe a dozen of those. Uh, when she did sign them, she would put her initials, LMC for Lily M. Crawford or LMP after she got married. So at least if she signed them, you knew whether they were post-1892 or pre-1892. Uh, and then about half a dozen of them, she put a date on it. And the only two that she had dated that were in this, the time frame of the diaries, uh, were two th pictures that she painted in 1885. Otherwise, all of her dates were you know, 1891, 1921, 1911, whatever. So it was nice to read the diaries and find out what other paintings she painted in this time period. And it turns out that I, I discovered seven paintings that she did during this time frame, uh, all of them in 1885 and 1886. So I'll mention, you know, three of them. This one, and these two here, were the ones that she mentioned in the 1885 diary. So I'm going to read some excerpts from the diary that talk about these these paintings. Uh, so remember, she went to Sedalia in 1880, 1884, and in 1885 to study. And what she studied was music and painting. Uh, music at that time, she studied music, piano in Boulder. So the music she studied in Sedalia was vocal, you know, singing. Uh, but so she studied painting. Unfortunately, we don't have any 1884 diaries, so I don't know what she painted during that uh, during her, her lessons there. In 1885, she said uh, in a letter back to the home, she said, "I've painted eight hours on my picture, but it will take several weeks to finish." Now her picture is this picture right here that she talks about. Uh, March 24th, she said, took a painting lesson, finished my clouds. Uh, throughout April, she, she kept notating, I painted this afternoon. Uh, April 20th, she said, I painted lots this afternoon, more I guess than I ever did at once before. June 2nd, I painted this afternoon, finished my picture and drew my parrot off on a large tray. So she presumably finished that one and started the parrot. Mm -hmm. uh, June 6th, she said, painted from nine o'clock till 6 p.m. Finished my mountain scene. It's the only time she ever called, said anything other than picture on this. So it's her mountain scene and also the parrot. I'm well pleased with both. Then I'll jump ahead. In June 24th, she said, I selected the molding for my picture and left it there. And you can see it has a, an incredible frame around it. 
So she, the last thing she did before she left Sedalia was to select that and get, get it framed. But then a year later, she had one more comment on the painting. Uh, this is in May of May 24th, 1886. She said, I painted the leaves to the mill and my initials on my large picture. I didn't touch the others. So this is definitely her, her largest picture that she ever painted. And you see in the corner here, she did sign it. She has LMC and the date, 85. So we know this is the, the picture she's talking about. And this also is the sawmill. Uh, she said, you know, painted the leaves of the mill, so that's the mill. And you notice this painting has some characteristics of Colorado. It's got the Rocky Mountains with the snow caps. It's got the sawmill, which is like the, the Sato sawmill here in Steamboat. It's got a stream going by, which could be uh, Soda Creek, Fish Creek, any of the creeks. There's a couple of boys here fishing sort of reminiscent of her two brothers fishing. But then there's the rest of the painting has some characteristics of Missouri where she was. The vegetation, the trees, you certainly wouldn't, wouldn't find these kind of trees here in, in a Steamboat. So the trees were from uh, Sedalia. And over here there's a, a little village, three or four buildings, frame buildings. And one of them is a church with a white steeple on it. Well, in, in northwestern Colorado, the first church building wasn't built for another 10 years. So obviously she, you know, she took a little bit of Sedalia and she took a little bit of Colorado and merged it into one painting, which she made up. This is not a, a realistic scene by any means. But I think it's, it's mar a marvelous painting also concerning it's her first uh, first painting that she ever did. And I think it shows it shows the, the work of her uh, of, of taking a class and being taught by somebody. Probably her teacher kept giving her advice of how to do things. Okay, so the, her second painting was this parrot. And the thing about the parrot is, I said she spent February of that year at the uh, World's Fair in New Orleans. She was living with her uncle, Uncle John and Aunt Annie, and they and some of their relatives went down to New Orleans and spent three weeks at the World's Fair. So I, during those three weeks, uh, Uncle John bought a parrot. Uh, they called it a bull, you know, B-O, and you know, brought it back up to Sedalia. So probably it was in the house where she was staying, and finally after she you know, finished the painting behind me, she decided to paint the parrot. And after she painted it, she said, uh, this is in a letter that she wrote back from Sedalia, I'm still painting. I finished a large white parrot on a trim tray and gave to Aunt Annie. So, yeah, I think it's a, a pretty good painting of the parrot there, very re realistic looking. And she said she finished that painting and uh, started her her flowers. And these flowers were, well she said, I'm, I'm taking lessons in flowers. So this one, we noticed this one that she wrote because she signed it and put 85 on it. Now I think both of these, you know, they're painted in a style with the black background. Because it's a white parrot and white roses, I think it's, you know, it looks quite nice. Uh, so the next year, it was, so she left Sedalia after painting those three paintings and came back to Steamboat. And Steamboat, her first painting that she mentioned is in November of 1885, she said, I commenced to paint a dog and some puppies on her. Don't know whether I can finish it or not. Now, unfortunately, I can't show you that painting because we've lost it. Uh, it's probably hidden in the house again, but we know there was a, a, an exhibit here at the museum, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, called The Arts of the Crawfords. And 
this painting, of the, the dog painting, was in that exhibit. So we know the painting exists. I, I have a photograph of it. But we just don't, we know that the museum doesn't have it, and so it's got to be somewhere in, in the house. But so that would have been her first painting um, that she did in Steamboat. And it likewise has a, a black background like these two paintings have. Okay, then in April, she said, I began a drawing of the valley. May 18th, she said, Mama caught two pretty trout, and I have been trying to paint them. And she said, uh, painted on my fish this afternoon. And then two days later, painted on my trout, got them some better. So, you know, again, it's the style of painting on black. I think because the fish are gray, it doesn't work quite as well. I think the parrot and the roses look much better. But so that's the second painting that she did in Steamboat. The third painting is this one that she mentioned about drawing of the valley. Uh, she said, June 10th, I painted on my Steamboat picture this morning a little. June 14th, I painted nearly all day on my Steamboat picture. Got considerable done. Finally, October 19th, she said, I finished my Steamboat Springs picture and think it real pretty. And I think it's pretty too. I think it's one of her top five paintings. Uh, it's small, but it's, you know, you, you can tell it's Steamboat. There's a photograph that was taken in 1887, which has the same perspective. And it has all the same buildings, and this, the fence down at the bottom, just like this painting does. So we know the painting is very realistic. The photograph actually has one more building in, in it. Uh, right, ne right in the middle here, the photograph has the, the second Steamboat Pilot building uh, that had just been finished. But anyway, so the, the th you know, some of the things I really like about this painting, first of all, it's, uh, it's quaint, uh, has all these skis. Every building here has a, a bunch of skis next to it, which you can look at when you come up close. And of course, back then, in the diary, she, she doesn't call them skis, she never uses that word. She says, um, snowshoes. So everybody's always using snowshoes. Well, interestingly, right in the center here is a pair of web snowshoes you know, what we would now call snowshoes. And so this painting shows you that back in the 1880s, both kinds of snowshoes existed. Both the, what we call skis and the web snowshoes were in existence. And so now I've got to reread the diary and see if I can tell if there's any indication when she's talking about people using snowshoes, are any of them the web snowshoes, or are they all the skis? Uh, so then, as I said, all these buildings that are here are in the the photograph that was in 1887, and this was, you know, a, a good view of what Steamboat was like back then. You know, there's a cluster of buildings here, which is uh, at Lincoln and Tenth Street. It's where the Conoco uh, gas station is now. That's, uh, there's actually three buildings. One of them is hidden by the other two buildings. They were owned by Milner. And the building that was hidden was called, in Louis' diary, she called it Hotel Milner. Uh, the two buildings that you can see here are a store that he built and the post office that he ran. The building down here is the old Henry Crawford a log cabin. And then in 1883, Henry was, uh, was gone, and Mr. French uh, started living in that building. And Mr. French built uh, an addition onto the cabin, which you can see here, the front addition. And that front addition was the first store in Steamboat. And then two years later, when James Hoyle came to town, French was gone, so Hoyle 
uh, started living in that building. And that extension, that addition, was where he printed the first edition of the Steamboat Pilot. So that's the first original pilot building. Uh, and then he built, or he, he had built the other building next to this log cabin. Uh, then the other buildings here, you can see down there, here at the bottom, one of these is a nice house that the Crawfords had, and the other one is a, a, a little barn that they kept their dairy cow in. Okay, the final thing I, I really like about this painting is over here in the corner of the flowers. You know, it's as if, you, I always associate those with painting flowers, because most, you know, certainly 80% of her, her paintings are paintings of flowers. So it's as if she painted this and said, I really want to paint some flowers, but it's, it's snow. <laughs> you know, you, you can't have flowers growing in the snow. So she just arbitrarily took a corner here and acted like there was a piece of wood there and painted the flowers on the wood. So I think it's very, you know, it, uh, I think it's pretty the way she did that. Okay, so that's the, uh, you know, the, the, the first paintings that Lily did. Uh, her masterpiece, her big masterpiece ending with her other landscape, which was uh, the steamboat picture. Where's my notes? <coughs> okay, the, the second sort of additional item, which uh, she talks about all the time in her diaries, is the organ. So if you go into the museum, into the main part there, the first room there has the Crawford organ there. Uh, it has her picture on it, I think, and a, a discussion of it. So she took these music lessons, uh, piano lessons in Boulder in 1882 during that year and a half period that she lived there. And then they bought an organ right before they came back to Steamboat. And they carried that organ with them in their, I think they had three wagons to, t to take the family's goods back to Steamboat. And the organ was in one of those three wagons. So when they finally got to Steamboat, uh, this is the day after they arrived in Steamboat, July 14th. She wrote, after dinner, Papa went up and brought the organ down and Mr. French came over and they put it up and we had some music right away fast. The organ is not in tune. <laughs> okay, the next day, July 15th was a Sunday. And so she talks about Sunday school. She says, we all dressed up in our best as if, if it was something grand. About 11 o'clock they began to come in till there were 15 and they commenced with prayer and the election of officers as follows. Superintendent, Mr. French, Assistant, uh, Haiti Buck, Secretary, Ms. Cushy Settle, Organist, Lulie Crawford. <laughs> Scripture was read and after that we practiced singing again and after that we adjourned and they went home. Now, I don't think it's a, any coincidence that the day after the organ arrived in Steamboat is when the first Sunday school uh, took place in Steamboat. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think the, the question is, did they buy the organ to give Lily something to play, or did they buy the organ because they wanted to, to start a Sunday school and they needed music for the Sunday school? So for the rest of her, uh, you know, her times in her diary when she was in Steamboat, every single Sunday she mentioned Sunday school. And, you know, she mentioned things like, we had quite a crowd come for Sunday school, or nobody, no Sunday school because nobody showed up, probably because of the storm. Uh, but, and, when it was held, she often talked about the music. You know, it was as if the, to her, Sunday school meant music. Uh, of course, she was biased because she was the organist. Uh, but then it was not just the Sunday school. Was, during the week, uh, there would be people who would come over and they would practice for Sunday school. Uh, one of them, Milner, the person who owned the buildings up, up where the Conoco station is, he would come over with his violin. And so they would practice 
duets, I guess, you know, violin and organ to prepare for the, the songs at Sunday school. So you can just tell, you know, Sunday school had, was a really important event now in St. Bolton. I, I think it was really the, the very first thing that led to the, the Steamboat community. You know, before then, it was just a bunch of, of you know, buildings and separate individuals living here. But once the, the Sunday school brought the people together in the Crawford House once a week, and people could come and, you know, socialize, have a good time singing and whatnot. Okay, and the, the, the second evening, Lily was also involved with the second thing that occurred that led to the, the community, the, you know, change, the converting from a bunch of cabins to a, a village. And that second thing was schools. Uh, Lily became the, the first public school teacher here in Steamboat. So, unfortunately, that was after she quit her diary in, in 1883, so I don't have anything to read about that first school year. But I do have... the classic photograph of the school building, which shows Lulu and, and some of the kids. And I also have... Uh, Well, she taught school in 83. I don't know what 84, because there's no diary. I think, I assume she taught school then. 85, uh, Mr. Baker was hired to, to teach school. And he taught also in January, February, and March of 86. But then Pa kept asking Lily, would she teach school again? And she kept saying no, she didn't want to. Well, it came to June and finally uh, Sato, Mr. Sato, the head of the school uh, school committee here, school board, talked to her and she wrote in her diary, I, I finally told them that I would teach school, partly because I wanted to accommodate them and partly because I wanted to make money. Uh, she ended up making $50 a month for her teaching. So she certainly from that day, out, day forward, she talked about the school every every day in her diary. But she also maintained this teacher's daily record book, mm -hmm. uh, which I happen to have. And it's, you know, it, it, there are pages in here which basically tell her what, the, how, what, how to do things and how to maintain records. Then there's a page which has basically the, the kids' attendance record. Mm -hmm. uh, when they were there, when they were tardy, uh, it shows that some of the students didn't start for a, a month or two. They didn't all start the same day. And then on another page here, uh, somewhere here. Yeah, here we go. Another page here is a page of, of visitors. So people would come to visit and they would sign her book. Uh, you know, maybe a couple dozen people came. And this list includes you know, a lot of the early pioneers. It includes her father, her uncle John and Aunt Annie, but it includes other people like Mr. White, who was the, the county superintendent of schools at the time. Uh, and lots of other people, lots of the parents of the, the students are listed here. Anyway, so it's, it's neat to you know, see something like this and read in her diary and see that the two match up well. In fact, there were times in her diary where I couldn't read the name of a visitor. And I would come to here and look on that date and say, oh, you know, it's Mr. Houston. Uh, and I could then look back at her handwriting and say, oh yeah, I, that was an H at the beginning. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I'm gonna have to hurry here. I'll, I'll just mention some of the other things. We've got a bunch of photographs. 
that her uncle John took during 1886. You know, he came, he and his wife Annie came to see him about every summer for 30 years. And in at least three years, 86, 87, and 89, he brought his camera. So he brought this camera and took a, a good dozen uh, pictures here, which I'll leave up here. And in her diary, she would mention, you know, we went to the uh, Fish Creek Falls and Uncle John took some photographs. Uh, or she had mentioned, oh, they had a, a funeral of uh, Pony Whitmore. And here's a picture of the, the grave on uh, Dream Island. Uh, there was one day she said they had a fishing contest and Uncle John won. So Ma uh, took a picture of the, the fish. And then the next day she wrote, uh, Uncle John decided to take another photograph of the fish. <laughs> and we've got, you know, two with different arrangements of the fish. So and it, it continues, you know, and so it's neat to be able to to see the photographs and to see her comments in the, the diaries. So these are those up here. Okay, one other thing that she had. Autograph album. Uh, turns out this was her second autograph album. If you read the diary that Lolita wrote in 1880, she received a Christmas present of a autograph album. Uh, but I, we don't have that album either, so that must be with the, the, yeah. the, the diary. So in 1882, she got another diary. And I'll see there's an entry here. Hattie and I got some autograph albums and several things uh, downtown. That was September 23rd. September 26th, three days later, she writes, Miss Loomis is going to take my autograph album up to Pennsylvania. So this is the first person who signed the, the book. And if I can find the page here. Maybe I can't find the page. What is an autograph album? Here we go. So here's the page that Miss Loomis signed. Mm -hmm. And you can see that she, this is why she took the, the book with her, home with her, because she made that beautiful drawing of some flowers there. And in fact, she wrote, life brings roses. Sincerely, your friend, Mae Loomis. So there's several other you know, photographs that people made that she wrote about in her diary, including one which was uh, written, made by Charles Baker, who was the other, the teacher that taught uh, there. And he wrote the, wrote, he signed his name. And here on the edge, there's something in cold. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I looked at it, it looked like it might be Morse code. So I used Morse code and one letter, one word came up, yes but the other words didn't mean anything. So then uh, she wrote, six months later, she wrote in her diary, I've just translated the graphic message in my autograph album that Mr. Baker wrote. It is, remember the little yes, taken I suppose from Cushy's uh, album. So I went back to this knowing that it now says remember the yes. Uh, and I said, well, maybe it's not Morse code. Maybe there was some other precursor to Morse code, and sure enough, there's something called the American code. And when I use the American code, wow. it sure enough does say, remember the yes. <laughs> so, okay, so I'll leave that up here, too. Okay, well, I, I don't have any time to say anything more. There's, there's a whole wealth of information in this book that it's going to take me months and months to uh, to delve into it all. But I, as I mentioned, I, the raw transcription is up on the website right now. And hopefully over the months, uh, I'll end up giving some of these uh, these little tidbits that, that I gather from the book and I'll 
write them write some of my results up on the website. So I guess that's that's all to anybody have any questions? Wish I could talk for hours. Just follow uh, Jim's route over Rollins Pass and uh, Middle Park, Gore Road. And she went the same route the whole time over Bertold Pass. Oh, Bertold Pass. Yeah, at that point, it, it originally started Rollins Pass, but yeah. uh, whenever Bertold Pass opened up, they went that way. They would take the train up to Georgetown, uh, go to Empire, and then go through Middle Park. Uh, the Hot Sulphur Springs, they lived in Hot Sulphur Springs for a year, so they still had friends that they stayed with there. And, uh, and you know, in her diary, she mentions every place that they stayed. You know, wh whose ranch they stayed at, Cousin's Ranch was one of them, uh, but the various ranches that they stayed with, or they would camp out at, at maybe where a certain uh, river or stream or whatnot. Um, but so it was, it was always the same route. When did they complete the Bertha Pass route? Yeah, you know, I'm not sure. It might, might have been 1883. Uh, hmm. It might have been. So if that's true, then the first two would have been over Rowan Pass. But uh, I'm not sure. Any more questions? Just got a question. What was the Meeker incident? That's the Meeker Massacre? I don't know. You don't know that? No. Uh, it's where the, the Indian, Indian Reservation, well, the Bureau of Indian Affairs had a, had their offices in Meeker. You know, the, it's the town of Meeker right now. And so the, the Indian Affairs superintendent lives there, along with a uh, half dozen other uh, employees of his. Anyway, he was forcing the Indians to give up their hunting and he wanted them to become farmers. So he plowed over their racetrack and, you know, to, to raise uh, vegetables. And uh, that infuriated the Indians. And so eventually, the Indians, well, eventually he, he called for soldiers to come down from Wyoming to the reservation. But part of their treaty had said the, no soldiers would ever enter the reservation. So as soon as the soldiers entered the reservation, they actually murdered or killed Meeker and a few of the white people there, and then kidnapped some of his wife and some of the other people and took off towards Utah. Uh, and then there was a battle between the Indians and the soldiers, which was north of Meeker. So that all, that battle occurred over three or four days. And word of that spread throughout the, the county. And everybody from Hayden, you know, to this part of the county came to the steamboat and stayed at the Crawford cabin. Hope, they, they hoped that they had safety in numbers. That they all stayed in the cabin and they, they actually built a, a fort and uh, had lookouts and the whole works, worried that the Indians would be coming at any minute. And they spent about two weeks there. After the two weeks, they ate up all the provisions. <laughs> People said that, no, now the Indians are gone to Utah, uh, everything is safe. But the Crawfords, you know, the, the, all their provisions were eaten up and they had nothing, they could do nothing other than uh, head back to Denver. Yeah, it, there wasn't time to go to Denver and bring another lo load of equipment uh, back to back to Steamboat. So there's a lot of that have been written has been written about the Meeker incident, and it's it's worth reading about. It was certainly a, a land shed uh, event in Northwest Colorado. Before that time, the Indians came to Steamboat every summertime. Uh, but a lot of people said that they didn't want to come and homestead here because 
they were worried about what might happen with the Indians. Once the Indians were gone in the Utah, you know, then it was, people had no qualms about coming here. So, the Crawfords, by the way, had no, they, they were best friends with the Indians. It was, they enjoyed living here and having the Indians come during the summertime, so they never had any problems with them. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.